Hello, and welcome to, More Intelligent Tomorrow, a wide-ranging exploration of the potential impact of AI on the world around us, as envisioned by the future heroes of the human and machine intelligence revolution. How to use data to build data-driven workforces. We'll discuss this and more with Kristen Sailing on today's episode. And now, your host, Ari Kaplan. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm really excited. I'd just like to say that everything that I'm um, speaking about today is my own opinion, my own experiences. I'm not presenting the official opinion of the Army. I'm just here to talk about things that uh, I'm working on and I'm passionate about. Great. Well, why don't we just start off telling us about what do you do with the Army today? I'm currently assigned as the Chief Analytics Officer for the Army Talent Management Task Force. That is kind of my primary duty, or it has been up until recently when um, my other hat that I wear, I was the Deputy for People Analytics in the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Manpower and Reserve Affairs. Then they hired my boss for the Joint AI Center. So I've got uh, two fairly large, but actually really complementary um, roles and responsibilities when it comes to talent management and people analytics. You started at West Point, but how did you go then from West Point to where you are now? So um, again, first uh, 12 years, uh, I was a combat engineer. I deployed to Iraq twice and Mm. held various different roles in there and really started digging into using my OR background when we were doing um, strategic planning, when we were doing resource alignment. It's like, we always had that bug of there's a better, there's a more efficient way to get after this. And I linked in with the operations research and systems analyst on the on the staff. And we actually solved how we were going to draw down our division area in Iraq using um, linear, nonlinear programming. Following that deployment, I had applied to go back and be an assistant professor at West Point in the Department of Systems Engineering. While I was at West Point, I made the decision that I wanted to keep working on these types of problems. I wanted to keep I wanted to keep math in my life. <laughs> but uh I also wanted to keep doing it for the Army because I loved the problem sets we were working on, just the variety of things we were able to solve. So I flipped over from being a combat engineer to being an operations research and systems analyst myself. Yeah, today now you're getting into AI as well, like AI for talent and talent for AI. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That That's kind of my passion project. Because as we look at the progression of analytics, um, a colleague of mine that actually works for uh, for Data Robot. He's working with me on a couple topics. He keeps using the phrase beginning with the end in mind. And even though a lot of the products that we're developing are not artificial intelligence themselves, we want to look at the evolution of those products, how they can become more and more autonomous, how we can implement intelligent mathematic decision rules into them. Because we know eventually we're probably going to have enough data that a lot of these processes can be automated and a lot of these decisions could even be intelligent. I really started delving into what the art of the possible was for all the different subsets of machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing, um, started delving into image recognition and AI and optical character recognition just because of the massive numbers of documents we had that we needed to be able to um to create machine readable versions of. You just regular AI is, is of interest and deep learning is something that's a li- oftentimes on more of the cutting edge. So what are some ways you, you or the army is doing, you know, image recognition or NLP? So we're using natural language processing right now. We're building out um, a library that we can use for talent management where we can align our knowledge, skills, and behaviors, which is we're considering that our common currency for talent management, the base attributes that we're going to use to recommend best fits for jobs, to recommend people where they should go on their individual development plans. But in order to be able to do that effectively, we needed to create a library that understood Army English Hmm. because we pulled in a lot of the existing libraries. We pulled data from Indeed, from Monster. we pulled in kind of the usual Tesseract flow and we, it was not giving us linkage to the things that we needed to link. I mean, as a combat engineer, you would think um, we use the terms, you know, sapper for a combat engineer, we breach obstacles, but you know, sapper breach and obstacles show a very, very small degree of linkage in the normal business competency library. So mm-hmm. we started thinking, okay, we need to generate our own. That's really cool. That makes a lot of sense. Um, 
Uh, I've seen that done before, like even in sports worlds where the vocabulary, the vernacular is a little yeah. bit different. Great. And like in terms of the scale of this, I know the army's like quite, quite large. How many millions of people working in yeah. different capacities? So if you pull all of it together, um, if you pull out all our three components, our active guard and reserve, our civilian workforce, you're looking at between 1.2 and 1.4 million people. Yes, yeah, so that that's a good a good scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think your educational background, you know, bodes very well for getting the democratization of AI. So, like for our listeners, what advice might you give, you know, to get from like that experimental hardcore PhD data scientist to like non technical people benefiting from it all? I'm really dying to get our chief of staff of the army on camera talking about his vision for not just um, AI and data technology, but for our technologists in the force. He, he draws a very good parallel to how we've, um, how we've distributed medical, um, medical talent throughout the army. So that provides us a really good model on how we look at training up our data workforce and talking to our chief data officer everybody's in the data workforce because everybody is using the information that we generate from these tools in some fashion, or they should be. Yeah, gr great advice. And you know, one, one thing that was very impressive in, in your background was the Army DCS G1. And you know, you, you were saying how you can forecast out 10 years into the future, which is great, and a, a force of 92,000 officers, which to me is mind-boggling. That, that's pretty immense. We did this on a monthly basis to feed, um, primarily to feed the budget process so that we knew how much we needed to budget for just for our force and for the training that was associated with them, but also so we could make recommendations on recruiting, commissioning, and promotion to make sure that we fill the Army requirements accordingly. But the problem with that was the method we were doing was accurate, but it was only accurate at the aggregate level. We'd had to do separate analysis, separate survival curves in order to get down into the details that we would need in order to be able to do targeted retention. So that was one of the things that had me pursuing uh, the retention prediction model. And I'm pursuing with, again, with the Institute for Defense Analysis, a performance prediction model where we Id ideally will meet those, we'll bring those two models together where we can identify the folks who have the indicators of performance and the indicators of critical skills that we're looking for, but are also ones who are likely to attrit, couple that with a randomized controlled trial or an RCT, where we identify what kind of incentives actually work to retain those folks, and we'll have a really good set of prescriptive analytics to feed the Army on how we not only identify who we want to keep, whether or not they're likely to leave, but what's going to incentivize them to actually stick around. We're not taking the commander out of the loop there. Mm -hmm. The translation from the analytic to action is 100% that leader's responsibility. Otherwise, you know, as you know, research can go into the transition valley of death. And it just doesn't quite make that transition into action. So as we're going forward with all of these projects, we've spent a lot of time working on the integration strategy. We don't want to just produce a report on the shelf or a model that somebody may or may not use. We want to look at, you know, what kind of what kind of attributes, what kind of associated talents, what kind of skills do people need in order to use these models? What kind of things does a commander need to know if I give if I give him or her a predicted level of attrition of their force? Well, what do, what do we need to teach them about how to use that information and what to do about it? You know, they have to be able to contextualize that information and make a decision. And I think out of those discussions came what's currently my passion project, which is the Army Data Literacy Program. Oh, that, that's great to hear. And you know, we keep trying to evolve you know, our education since you know the market keeps changing and improving and products keep coming out and feature sets. So yeah, really glad to hear you, uh, you know, were involved in that and continue to do so. Um, and then one other thing when you're talking about the, uh, you know, the quality of life, I saw that uh, in location that you were in Hawaii a lot of the time. For me, that sounds that amazing. Was. What was that like? So that was, it was a lot of fun being out there in Hawaii, especially because I was out there twice, but I worked on very different problem sets at the time. It's a hard job, but 
someone has to manage the uh, sunrises and sunsets. <laughs> Sometimes that was all I got to see because I was working in a secure environment. Um, I would commute in, go, hey, look, there's the beach. There's a pretty sunset. <laughs> I'm going to be in a box all day. Thank you. <laughs> Great. And um, what technologies are you most excited about seeing coming out? So I love tools. I mean, th this is not to, you know, beef up data robot, but I love seeing all the low code and no code solutions coming out where we can really empower the folks who aren't coders necessarily to be able to do some hypothesis generation and see what kind of models they can pull from data. Um, the education piece, obviously, I'm very excited about. As we start bringing more of our, um, more of our enterprise programs online, I think we're starting to see the emergence of a data fabric for the people enterprise stretching into other enterprises where we have a federated data space. Largely, when we start thinking about data lakes, we still approach them in just as larger silos. We've had siloed data for a lot of years, but then we started using these data lakes as just larger silos. Instead of looking at how this information can be federated across the space, shared, and used in some very complex analytics. And that, that kind of brings me to the question of governance. How do we govern uh, and protect personal privacy and personal data in a fully federated data fabric, which really gets me excited about some of the tools we're seeing come out for pattern recognition and intelligent metadata, where things are tagged upon the point of entry. Very good. And the, the name of this podcast is More Intelligent Tomorrow. So I wanted to get your thoughts on, like, what is the world like or the Army like five, ten years from now? So we look at just the different ways we're going to be able to partner with and, and utilize technology. I think everybody's starting to talk about human-machine teaming. And a lot of times people have very different uh, ideas on what that looks like. Are you, um, you know, part of a, a squad that includes autonomous systems? Or do you have an intelligent assistant? Does everybody have, you know, their own version of Jarvis or Friday mm -hmm. who's helping them, you know, research problems and build things and order things or just at least keep their calendar ordered? We've been joking about having intelligent integrated contact lenses where you just see your own personal digital display. A lot of times I look to the gamers for some of this insight because if we're not partnering with... Um, with, with the gaming industry on this, where you have these large screens where people have dashboards up, where they've done their human factors engineering to see what kind of information people need, where there's, you know, you've got your little map down in the corner, it's your geospatial positioning information, um, targeting information, you know, what kind of things are we ingesting then? And I think we're missing an opportunity. I personally am a, a big fanatic of uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, you know, for simulations, but mm -hmm. yeah, getting into the contact lens, uh, actually one of my Caltech uh, uh, housemates did come out with, you know, some of the first contact lens displays, you know, very rudimentary, um, you know, the power on it's pretty low, but what are your thoughts? When might that come out uh, in a practical sense? Oh, that's something I would love to delve into, but <laughs> I, I don't know yet. It's, it's right now we're, we've kind of, we've got a really burgeoning and growing DOD um, innovation and kind of futurist community that's developing. And uh, over the past few years, we're just, you know, we're pulling more and more people into these conversations and just kind of, what's the realm of the possible look like? What does the Army look like? What does our roles and our functions look like as we go out to, we kind of use 2028 as one of the benchmarks for our multi-domain operations. And then we start looking at 2035 and beyond just because those are ways where we can kind of at least frame the story that we need to tell in order to get people thinking about this. Um, I, th I think storytelling is a hugely important part of getting people to think about not just the technology, but how we're going to integrate it into our lives. Mm -hmm. General McConville likes to talk about looking at the emergent behaviors that have come out of something as simple as the evolution of a phone. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, we used to use it just to call people, and now I'm using it to record a podcast with More Intelligent Tomorrow. People migrate away from um, regular, you know, cable television, this kind of this, oh, we've got to be here at a particular time in order to catch this information. No, it's everything's on demand. We're moving to an on-demand world. And I think we can predict a lot of this. I think we can see some of the trends in having things on demand 
in how people integrate these type of things into the way they live and work. But we're, we're still, as a complexity scientist, I always have to say, you know, we're going to see emergent behaviors. We're going to see that tweak that happens in the matrix. We're going to see that bend that comes. Um, I, I would say, you know, Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park was a very formative experience in my life when I was reading that. God, I think it was in junior high or early in high school and just fell in love with the concept of um, not just fractal geometry, but how we could use that to explain large scale events and emergent behaviors in society. Yeah, I love all of this. I especially love how you're uh, talking about augmenting the human experience. You know, you have the human still with the contact lens, with the Jarvis. What are your thoughts on like, com in some cases, complete automation, like automated drone swarms or, uh, you know, saving humans for certain tasks and automating uh, other tasks? This, it all feels like it's going to be new to us, but it isn't really. I mean, if you look at how factories work right now, just how much of, you know, an automotive plant is automated where it used to be, you know, a particular part of skilled workforce. And I think we need to look at just how, um, what kind of jobs are going to be fully automated, automated, what kind of things are going to be augmented, mm -hmm. and then what kind of things that we're always really going to have people doing. And I say always, but I think any futurist has to say always with a grain of, a grain of salt, because we're going to see, a kind, of, kind of coming back to those emergent behaviors, we're going to see people using technologies in ways that we never anticipated. I mean, who could have anticipated just the rise of social media influencers that, you know, we used to make fun of the guys who did jackass because they did so many right. stunts and people paid them for it. Now you've got TikTok and people do it all day and they create huge followings and that's their bread and butter. They, they have jackass and 3D on virtual reality. Just just saying it's now we have so much content streaming. It's a totally different competition environment for information to get out. And that kind of brings us back to what we see the future mm -hmm. working like in terms of um, kind of coming back to military competition. I don't think the future of military competition when it comes to the digital environment is necessarily going to be what we think it is. A lot of times we talk about um, the risks that we face and people start talking about, well, what happens when they, you know, the EMP happens or they cut mm -hmm. the cable or everything starts looking like um, post-apocalyptic World War Z or, you know, Falling Skies, any number of these other um, post-apocalyptic shows that have said, look what a return back to the Stone Age does to us. That's a threat. But I mm -hmm. think as we look at all the different ways people are using technology to process information and share information, I think we need to think about what happens in an environment where you have things like deep fakes, where they're readily accessible, yes. where we have people meddling with information sources, where we have, you know, news of varying quality and quantity. What happens when we have these data streams and we start getting reliant on them and we find out that we actually can't trust them because someone seeded bad information into our machine learning model? Those things, the more subtle things, everybody likes to focus on the big hack, but the most dangerous hack is the one that you don't notice and that until you realize that it's been there for a year siphoning off information. We have to start thinking about not just the big events, but the subtle ones. Because as you have this proliferation of digital technology and digital innovation, there's going to be a lot of people thinking about how to use it creative or creatively. And all emergent behaviors are not necessarily positive ones. And we really have to think about and guard against what, um, what kind of things might happen and how we might respond to them as a society. Yeah, that, that's going to be a big challenge that deep fakes are already easy enough, like on a positive side, you know, bringing expired relatives or people from the past to life is cool or having, you know, fun with, you know, your friends. But yeah, uh, it could be almost a post-truth or a people who don't trust the truth uh, mm -hmm. type of world. Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, I'm just, um, my husband is a visual effects artist. He used to do special mm -hmm. effects for TV shows and movies. And just seeing the number of things that he was able to do, was just like, I'm never going to trust anything <laughs> I see on TV again. But That's like, very cool. Hey, you realize some of the movie monsters aren't real. But then when you look at, you know, such and such actress has been slimmed down 30 pounds. There's almost like digital um, plastic surgery that's happening all the time. And you kind of wonder, it's like as, as people's perceptions evolve into what's real and what's not, it's those subtle ones that really, you know, kind of make you think. 
Well, Chris, this has been tremendous. I totally appreciate all of your thoughts. So thank you for being part of the podcast. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. 